Hello and welcome to Living as Well as Possible, an introduction to supportive and palliative care. I'm Krista Ellis, a community engagement manager for the Parkinson's Foundation. Helping me behind the scenes are my colleagues Jenny Fierde and Jen DeGruccio. We warmly welcome you to the webinar today, especially anyone joining us for the first time. Today we are excited to be kicking off our six-part series on palliative care. Living with Parkinson's can be challenging not only physically, but emotionally and spiritually. One way to address these additional needs beyond motor symptoms is through palliative care, which focuses on improving quality of life. Each episode in this series will cover the different needs for people with Parkinson's and their families. Today's program, we will address what palliative care is and how to use the tools and skills presented in this series to have the best quality of life, no matter what stage you are in. We hope you will join us for all our palliative care programs. Please note we are recording today's presentation and you will receive a follow-up email from us with a link for today's recording and the slides. As we begin, we want to welcome you and take a moment to share the mission of the Parkinson's Foundation. Every day and in everything we do, we are working to make life better for people with Parkinson's. To achieve our mission, we pursue three goals. Improve care for everyone with Parkinson's, advance research toward a cure, and empower and educate our global community. Today's program is a great example of one of the things we're doing to help us meet these goals. One example of our mission in action is PD Generation. This research offers genetic testing for PD-related genes and genetic counseling to people with Parkinson's at no cost. Commit to helping us advance Parkinson's research today and check your eligibility and enroll now to be a part of PD Generation at parkinson.org slash PD Generation. We'd like to take this moment to thank PCORI, a patient-centered outcomes research institute for their implementation award to support our palliative care series. Thank you, PCORI. If you are looking to get involved, we're excited to share our initiative meant to capture the community's perspective on various topics in Parkinson's disease. We hope that you'll join us by signing up for this initiative where we invite you to complete a 10 to 20 minute survey on various topics such as mental health, telehealth, and care partners. We will always report findings back to the community. You can learn more at parkinson.org slash PF surveys. And now I am pleased to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Benzie Kluger. Dr. Kluger created one of the first team-based neuropalliative care clinics in the world at the University of Colorado. He has published numerous papers important to the growth of this field. His research focuses on neuropalliative care, fatigue, and neurodegenerative illness, with some brief excursions into other areas, including nutrition, acupuncture, and cannabis. He is currently a professor of neurology and medicine and the director of the Palliative Care Research Center and Neuropalliative Care Service at the University of Rochester. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Benzi Kluger. Thank you, Krista. I will uh, share my slides now. And thank you everyone for joining us today for this really important topic. Um, so, yeah, as, as Krista said, this really does tie into the Parkinson's Foundation uh, core mission of trying to improve care. Um, and as I hope to uh, convince you by the end of this talk that is, this is relevant to all people affected by Parkinson's. So that includes people living with Parkinson's and, and their families. And our, our goal with all of this work is to live as well as possible, no matter what is happening uh, with your Parkinson's disease. So the objectives for today's uh, talk are to define supportive and palliative care, and, and just uh, to let you know right now that those terms are, are really interchangeable. Uh, but supportive care, I think, is more intuitive for many people and has a little bit less uh, stereotypes uh, than palliative care, which people often associate with hospice. Uh, we want you to understand why supportive and palliative care are relevant to all people living with Parkinson's. And then we'll talk about how you can use the palliative care approach and palliative care philosophy in your own life uh, starting today. So we'll talk about using the palliative care mindset to improve self-care and resilience, talk about how to apply palliative care skills that may improve the care you get from your current healthcare providers. You don't have to see a palliative care specialist to get palliative care. 
And lastly, to know when you might need an extra layer of support from a supportive or, or a palliative care specialist and what situations uh, those might apply to. So just a little bit of uh, personal background. Uh, so I, I am a neurologist and I did my training at the University of Colorado. I went to Florida for doing behavioral and movement disorder fellowships. I came back uh, to the University of Colorado and was ready to, to set up shop. And um, as I was seeing patients, I found out a lot of things that I didn't learn in my training. And when I'm training and, and I'm a medical student or a resident and I see somebody with Parkinson's or, or progressive supranuclear palsy or Lewy body disease, um, as a resident or a student, I'm excited to make the right diagnosis or to start the right treatment. And things are very focused on the disease. Uh, but after I got out into practice and had my own patients who I was seeing over time, um, there was no longer this kind of biomedical snapshot. There was uh, stories behind every person I saw. And, and I found that the model of care that we were working in, a model of care that really focused on the disease, uh, left me unsatisfied and left my patients unsatisfied. There were a lot of things uh, such as grief and sadness uh, being able to plan for the future, being able to cope and, and retain hope in the face of an illness like Parkinson's for which we don't have a cure. Um, and I was really troubled by that. And that led me into the world of, of palliative care. And I was also helped along as I am with almost everything that I do by uh, patients I was seeing. And I'd like to call out a few here. One is Kirk Hall, who some of you may know. Uh, Kirk is a gentleman with Parkinson's disease who I've known for over a decade. And um, over, I think it was in 2011, he invited me to speak to a support group about uh, death with dignity. Um, and it was an eye-opening experience for me because I, I just had not realized uh, the fears people had about the future, fears of dementia, fears uh, around death, uh, the need for education around end of life, but also things happening much earlier than that. Um, and, and Kirk's been a, a partner in crime with me uh, from that time forward. Um, also, uh, these two young women, uh, Chris and Juju, who have uh, Huntington's disease, uh, they were diagnosed at ages uh, 9 and 11, and I can remember distinctly the first time I met them. Uh, Juju, who was the younger, uh, was having significant pain. Um, I helped her get into hospice. We treated her pain, uh, made her a lot more comfortable. And her older sister, uh, Krissa, who uh, was always a very special patient to me, I can remember one visit, uh, where she was having problems sleeping, and I asked her why, and she told me she was afraid of dying in her sleep. Um, and for me, that was just a, a, a light bulb moment, and it made me recognize that if I really wanted to help people like uh, Carissa and, and Kirk and others with their sleep and with so many other things, that I had to go outside the biomedical model, because uh, we're not taught about um, the fear of death in the biomedical model. We're not taught about the frustration of, of living every day for the rest of your life with a certain illness. We're not taught about grief. We're not taught about how to support family. And so that was really a turning point for me to get deeper into this model of care and to really work hard to try to make this a new standard. Um, by way of background on this specific project, um, palliative care, also known as supportive care, is a person and family-centered approach to care that really focuses on improving quality of life and reducing suffering from any source. And we'll talk a lot more about what that means. Uh, we have reached a point um, through work that I've done, work that a lot of my colleagues and other people around the world have done, to show that this model of care helps people with Parkinson's disease. Um, and uh, there's been quite a bit of effort in the world of cancer. And when people hear the word palliative care, they often think about cancer and hospice. And palliative care is great in those settings, uh, but it's also great outside of those settings. And so we felt like the time had come to make palliative care and supportive care a new standard for people living with Parkinson's disease. And I've been lucky, we've been lucky that the Parkinson's Foundation uh, has partnered with me and partnered with our uh, community of people in the world of palliative care um, to really make this a reality and, and to uh, work to transform, and, and this is already underway, to make a new and a higher and a more comprehensive standard of care for people living with Parkinson's and their families. Um, so what is uh, supportive and palliative care? So in, in a nutshell, palliative care is about living as well as possible for as long as possible. And I underline living there purposefully because there's a difference between living and surviving. Uh, living includes joy, it includes meaning, it includes connection. And those are really the heart of palliative care. How can we live well despite having a serious illness, no matter what stage of the illness we're in? 
Um, I also want to address this naming issue. Um, so palliative care is supportive care. Uh, they, they are the same thing. But what we've learned um, in the past is that people are more likely to go to a supportive care clinic than a palliative care clinic. Doctors are more likely to refer to a supportive care clinic than a palliative care clinic. Um, and I think that's for a couple of reasons. One is that the word supportive is intuitive. We understand that we want an extra layer of support. Uh, the other is that people oftentimes have uh, misperceptions about what palliative care is, that they think palliative care means end of life. They think that palliative care means giving up. Um, and I'm here to assure you that palliative care, neither palliative care nor supportive care are, are either of those things. Uh, they, they are the same thing, and they are really about supporting people to live as well as possible, uh, to improve quality of life, and if there are sources of suffering, that we work to address them. Essential elements of palliative care, and this comes from the World Health Organization, is that we want to enhance quality of life, and that goes beyond just reducing suffering and, tr and treating symptoms. So some examples of that, um, I have a, uh, a patient and, and her husband who are living half of the year in an RV and doing a lot of travel, and, and that came about because I am working actively to support them in their travel. I'm, I'm calling in prescriptions all over the place. Um, and we also talked about their goals and we had an open and honest discussion about what this illness would look like now and in the future. And so they're really maximizing their time. Um, it could be something as simple as treating somebody's pain so that they can enjoy uh, a soccer game with their grandson more often or be able to participate in their boxing class. Um, so it's really focused on improving quality of life. Um, it's offering support to help people live as actively as they can. Um, it also offers support to families. So as I, I love saying is that Parkinson's doesn't just affect one person, it affects a family, it affects a community. Um, and that's part of the target of palliative care is to make sure that we offer support to the family. Um, palliative care offers relief from pain and other distressing symptoms, uh, symptoms that oftentimes fall between the cracks between primary care and neurology. It affirms life and regards dying as normal processes. So sometimes, um, you know, both within the doctor's office and outside of the doctor's office, there are certain topics that seem to be off the table. Um, and palliative care wants to put anything that a patient or family wants to talk about on the cable and, and allow us to talk about it openly and honestly so that we can, we can deal with that and we can help people through it with no regrets. Uh, we want to address emotional, social, and spiritual issues. And I use the word issues purposefully and not symptoms because there are normal things that are uncomfortable that happen when you have a serious illness like Parkinson's. People can feel sad, they can be worried about the future, they may be frustrated, uh, they may feel guilty that they're not doing more as a caregiver, and those are normal but challenging emotions, and we wanna support people in those normal and challenging emotions. Um, and lastly, to make clear that this is applicable early in the course of an illness. Um, in fact, the time of diagnosis is a time that's very stressful and people could use a lot of support around. And it can be used in conjunction with other therapies, uh, such as even uh, deep brain stimulation. And that's another time where people might benefit from an extra layer of support. Um, one of the things that, that Kirk Hall and Melina Summerall and other people, Gil Talen, who I've, I've worked with, have educated me on is changing the way I think about uh, palliative care. And so rather than really focusing just on palliative care specialists and neural palliative care specialists, which are people who do palliative care for neurologic illnesses, uh, we also want to think about palliative care for everybody. And if we want palliative care for everybody and we want palliative care to be delivered early, uh, we can't just rely on specialists. So we also need community and disease support organizations to include a palliative care approach and framework. And we need to educate and involve primary care providers and non-palliative specialists, such as neurologists, social workers, nurses, and others, in terms of providing this total framework and this comprehensive care that we're calling supportive and palliative care. Um, you, uh, a person living with Parkinson's or a family member of Parkinson's, have two very important roles in palliative care. Um, so the first is that palliative care at its heart is based on conversation and it's based on dialogue. And so it's very important uh, that uh, the patient and family are actively engaged with everything that we do. If I am taking care of somebody with Parkinson's, I cannot do uh, palliative care without understanding them as an individual. So what are the values that should drive care? Uh, for some people that might be traveling, it might be spending time with your family. Um, it might be that you want to minimize uh, medication, you want to minimize time in the hospital or with doctors. Um, it may mean that you want to, uh, quote, do everything possible to live as long as possible and that, and that you're okay with undergoing certain procedures or going to the hospital if it means that you may have more time with your loved one. And so all those things are important and they're all going to be different from individual to individual. 
Uh, secondly, and this is also something that um, you know might seem obvious, but it's not obvious from the outside, is what aspects of the illness are causing the greatest suffering. Um, so if I see 10 people with Parkinson's disease, I might get 10 different answers from what's the toughest part of this for you. Um, and those answers might range from it's the tremor because I'm unable to uh, play music the way I used to do. It may be depression. It may be um, I feel like I'm a burden or to my uh, loved ones. It may be that I'm losing my sense of self. Um, it may be uh, pain that I'm having when, I, when my medicines wear off. So there's a whole host of things that may be the toughest thing, and we want to make sure that we really address that. And, and we won't know that unless we get that input from you. And some of those things, uh, fatigue, pain, um, emotional distress, spiritual distress are invisible. And there's, and there's no way for me to know from the outside uh, what those things are. Um, and the last thing is, is uh, we need guidance to know what are the opportunities that exist for living well. And so uh, how can we find joy, meaning, and love with Parkinson's? And, and that could mean being able to continue to travel using um, an RV, uh, spending time with family. Um, it may be that religion or Christianity or prayer or meditation is very important to you. But whatever those things are, we want to make sure that we build those into the plan and that we want to make sure that that becomes part of the care uh, that we provide and part of the care that we prepare you and your family for in the future. Uh, the second thing, which is very important, and I really want to stress this, is that you you and your family have the power to improve the care uh, that you receive. Um, so, um, and, we, and we can talk more about this, and, and we can talk about opportunities to see specialist palliative care and what's happening at the Centers of Excellence. Uh, but right now, today, you have the power to change the care that you're receiving from your healthcare providers. Um, and some of the ways that you can do this is that you can set the agenda for your visit. You can say at the outset, these are the three most important things that I want to talk to you about today. It's my pain. I want to learn more about what I can expect with my Parkinson's in the future. And I'm concerned about medication side effects. So you can have an active role in driving the agenda and making sure that it's really person and family centered. Uh, you can bring up important topics and tough conversations. And part of my work with the Parkinson's Foundation is working with um, healthcare providers, with doctors, with nurses, to teach them some communication skills and conversation skills uh, to be able to talk about tough things, such as what the future holds. Uh, but sometimes uh, providers don't bring those things up because they feel like they may be distressing. And, and sometimes they are distressing. These can be tough topics to talk about, but they may be tough topics that you want to talk about. And so letting your providers know that I, I know it's a, a tough topic, but I really do want to know uh, what my future holds or what to expect in the next year or, or when should I stop working. Um, also, let them know your preferences for information. So you may not want to know everything about the future. You may hearing too much may make you overwhelmed. It might make you feel that you're going to bring bad things onto yourself. And so you may let your providers know that um, you know I want to know about this and this, but I don't want to know about that. I really want to just focus on on the next few months and try to live as much as I can in the present. And, and that's fine. And that's important for you to let your providers know so that they don't make assumptions. Um, lastly, you have the power and you have the right to request referrals. You can see specialists. Um, these may be pain specialists. They may be specialists with uh, gastrointestinal function to help with constipation. They could be mental health counselors, and they may be palliative care specialists. They can also be specialists to get a second opinion. Uh, but those are things that you can do to try to improve the care that you are receiving. Uh, lastly, I do want to bring up, and there will be a, a separate module that focuses on this, but just because it is an important topic of what is hospice. And so in the United States, and this can vary country to country, but in the United States, hospice is palliative care that's specifically focused on people nearing the end of life. Um, in some other countries, the term hospice uh, may be used differently. Um, in some other countries, hospice uh, refers specifically to a place of care. Um, in the United States, 90% of people who get the hospice benefit get hospice at home or in their place of residence, but it's important that if you're watching this seminar from outside of the United States, um, uh, that there may be differences in terms of what end-of-life palliative care looks like, but almost all uh, nations do have some form of end-of-life palliative care, and the goals of hospice are really to maximize comfort and avoid hospitalizations. Um, I would also like to say that hospice, just like palliative care, is not about giving up. And that I have had patients, actually my record holder was on hospice for six years. I've had patients who graduated from hospice because they've done so well. So sometimes when we shift the focus of care to staying at home and to being comfortable, people can actually do better. 
And so again, the goal of hospice, and when I have conversations about hospice, I, I always like to focus on what are our goals and what can we do to meet those goals? And if hospice can help us meet those goals, great. But hospice in general really shouldn't be a choice about giving up. It should really be a choice about uh, trying to add an extra layer of support to make sure that your family and your needs and goals and values are being met. So why is palliative care um, important for all people living with Parkinson's? Um, and and I, I would say that the biggest reason, and, and this is from a, a poem that, that I love from Mary Oliver. So tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Uh, when I think about palliative care, when I'm taking care of people in my, in my palliative care clinic, uh, the question I have is, how can we make the most of whatever time that we have? How can we make the best decisions so that we don't have regrets now or in the future? Um, and that can be starting at the time of diagnosis and what can we do in terms of planning for work and spending time with family and making sure that we make the most of the years where you're able to be very mobile. Um, it also may even be near the end of life and how can we make the most of that time? Do we need to have a family reunion? Do we need to do certain things to make this person comfortable to allow them to um, interact as much as they can with their children? Uh, but let's make the best use of the time that we have. And, and that really is the heart of palliative care. And, and so it's so essential and, and so important. There's different dimensions of this. So one dimension of it is that we want to treat what's been called in, in the world of palliative care, the total pain of serious illness. Um, and so we know that uh, the pain of having a serious illness goes outside the biomedical model. There's not just physical pain. Uh, Parkinson's is not just brain circuits and tremor. Uh, uh, Parkinson's, which is a serious illness, has many dimensions. So there's psychological, social, physical, and spiritual dimensions. And these are just some of the things that, that I associate with the total pain of Parkinson's disease. These are some of the things that I hear uh, when I ask people, what is the toughest part of this illness for you? And so it can be physical things like motor symptoms, tremor, non-motor symptoms like pain, fatigue, constipation. Uh, they can be emotional um, things that like depression, anxiety, also normal grief, worries, and frustration, a uh, sense of guilt. Um, and all of these things I want to also emphasize can be uh, things that are tough for the patient or things that are tough for the family. Um, social issues, uh, and I think particularly since COVID, loneliness, isolation, changes in role, changes in relationships, uh, spiritual issues, uh, feeling hopeless about the future, uh, feeling that life has become meaningless, challenges to one's faith, uh, change in identity. Um, and there's practical issues that people worry about quite a lot. Can I afford future care, uh, transportation, particularly if I'm no longer able to drive? Uh, how do I coordinate care across doctors? How do I get my healthcare providers to talk to each other? All of these things are part of the total pain of Parkinson's. Um, and all of these things are fair game uh, to approach and address with a palliative care approach. Uh, we want to also and, and equally find the positive without denying the negative. Um, so palliative care is not about uh, just positive thinking. Um, but we want to make sure that we acknowledge the grief. We want to make sure that we acknowledge how tough and, and you know, the fact that, you know, in, in short words, Parkinson sucks. Um, and at the same time, we don't want to lose the opportunity to make the most of what time we have. And so we want to look at their opportunities to bring more meaning into your life, whether that's through religion, family values for care partners to reconnect with why it's so important to you to be a caregiver or a care partner, uh, love and connection. So finding more times and opportunities to be with family, friends, community, um, helping to educate family and friends so they don't feel so awkward spending time with you, letting them know how to spend time with you. Um, hope, um, which could be for a cure, it could be for better care, it could be around personal goals, um, could be hope for your loved ones or hope for a legacy. Um, and then joy, which could be uh, simple pleasures, eating more of your favorite food, uh, travel, friendship, movies, music, um, uh, in one case, skydiving, you know, whatever, whatever that happens to be. Um, how can we find more of what's important to make uh, you feel like you're living your life rather than just surviving? Um, I don't want to talk about death a lot, but, but I do want to mention that people can die from complications of Parkinson's, and Parkinson's is the 14th leading cause of death in the United States. Uh, that does not mean you are going to die of your Parkinson's, but it's something to throw out there. Um, I would also say that the world mortality rate is, is flat. It's 100%. And so whether you die with Parkinson's or of Parkinson's, uh, death is unfortunately something that we all have to deal with in one way or another. 
And for most people, if they had a choice, they would choose to die at home, uh, die with their loved ones, not die in an ICU, um, not go through a lot of trauma and procedures near the end of life if it's not going to really benefit them. And those are things that palliative care and hospice in particular can help with is to give people more control so that they can die with a sense of control and with dignity. Um, the other thing is that there are gaps in our current model of care, and, and this is part of why I think it's important that you become part of the change, the Parkinson's Foundation and others become part of the change, but we are still living under a biomedical model. Um, this is the way healthcare gets paid for, this is the way healthcare systems work for the most part, is they're focused on diseases. Um, and palliative care is part of a lot of uh, other factors that are really trying to move towards a biopsychosocial model where we're addressing social factors, psychological factors, biological factors, and really trying to put the person at the center of care rather than diseases at the center of care. But we're not there yet. There, there are gaps in our system, and we are working avidly to try to, try to make those changes at, at multiple different levels, uh, from policy to, uh, to the way individual patients and families uh, request care. And that all comes into this project, into these video series. So we have identified five pillars, five targets of team-based palliative care for Parkinson's that we are working avidly to make a new standard of care across uh, Parkinson's Foundation Centers of Excellence and beyond. Uh, so we want the standard to be that everybody with Parkinson's gets systematic and comprehensive support uh, for non-motor symptoms. So that pain, depression, constipation, that those things don't get missed and they get treated actively. Uh, that care partners proactively get asked about how they're doing and are given support so that they don't burn out. Uh, that we ask about challenging emotions and spiritual well-being and that we go beyond the psychiatric uh, anxiety and depression and things that are treated with medications to also talk about some of the normal but challenging aspects of Parkinson's. Uh, we want to help people to plan for their futures and to give people a roadmap for what's ahead so that they can feel more secure um, about the choices they make now and the choices they make in the future. And lastly, we want to make sure that people get specialist palliative care and hospice, that it's available and that it's provided in a timely um, and appropriate fashion. Um, so how can we do this? So part of this is to adopt this palliative care philosophy and this palliative care mindset. And there's a few aspects to that. So one is, as we talked about, is to reduce suffering. And so for individuals here, and we're happy to share slides, I also wrote a, a blog about this if people want to check out my website and, and read more about it. But we want to think about what are the sources of suffering? So can you name those things that are toughest for you? And, and, and can we go through and what are the options for each of those things for either a cure? An example of that is that pain might be the toughest thing. And so it may be that you talk to your, your neurologist about it and work with physical therapy and potentially a pain medicine doctor uh, to reduce your, your shoulder pain. And that's a, definitely an outcome that sometimes happens. Maybe it's uh, coping with something better. And so there may be something that we're not able to get rid of, uh, that, that you have some problems with balance. And despite DBS and medications, we can change that. But how can we allow you to continue to live your best life uh, despite that? Um, and lastly is compassion. So can you find compassion for yourself, uh, for your family, for your situation? Can you recognize that there are other people with Parkinson's who are also um, going through this um, and, and find a space of self-compassion uh, where you can uh, sit with these things and potentially even sit with the uh, grief and loss, um, uh, potentially working with a counselor to be able to come to terms uh, with the source of suffering. Um, second is, can we increase joy? And I'm using the word joy pretty broadly, but what are the strengths, values, loves, joys, activities uh, that you carry into this illness? How have you gotten through tough times before? Um, and how can you stay connected to those important parts of who you are and what you value in your current situation? And might there be some ways to adopt or adapt or stay connected, uh, potentially even new opportunities? Uh, I've had some people who've gotten into music or art or other things uh, after their Parkinson's boxing is one that, that comes up. Um, uh, that you may want to explore and that might become a new opportunity for joy for you. Um, and lastly is a community to find your people. And so who in your personal and healthcare community can you turn to to share your suffering and celebrate your joy? Um, on the healthcare side, uh, this you know could be doctors, nurses, social workers, chaplains, therapists, counselors, um, a, a whole host of people uh, that might go beyond your current team uh, to help you address what's toughest to you or, or help you achieve your goals around meaning or joy or connection. And on the personal side, uh, to identify and, and even to be bold enough to reach out uh, to get friends, family, spiritual community, neighbors, support group involved, 
I would say one of the joys of the work that I do is that people are often more willing and excited to help. Um, in fact, are oftentimes waiting for you to ask them. Um, and, and so when we get to see those connections happen, it's, it's really fulfilling, but there may be more support out there than, than you currently recognize. Um, so to shift gears a, a little bit, so building out from the self-care mindset is how can you get more from your healthcare team using this palliative care skill set and tool set? And so I'm going to go through each of these pillars and, and future talks are going to go through these in a lot more detail uh, to talk about what are the skills and what are the tools that you can do to bring these pillars of palliative care into the care that you're currently getting from your, your current healthcare team. Um, so the first of these pillars is non-motor symptoms. And we know from, from research, there have been several studies that these symptoms, because they're invisible, are oftentimes not seen by your doctors. Um, we also know that uh, patients are sometimes confused about who should uh, address this. Is this a problem for my primary care doctor? Is this a problem uh, that my neurologist should address? And so to put these on the table, to make these visible, one way to do that would be to come in with an agenda or come in with a symptom checklist. And so you can come into your visit and say, these are the three most important things that I want to address today. And that might be pain, it might be fatigue, could be constipation, could be any of these things, which are things that we know oftentimes fall between the cracks that are things that may be embarrassing, uh, things that may not naturally come to mind or, or not naturally part of your, your physician's uh, uh, clinic flow. Uh, but nonetheless, if you bring them up, I can almost guarantee you that your doctor will address them in one way or another. They may um, address it directly. They may tell you, actually, this is something that your primary care doctor uh, would be better for, or this is something that maybe we need you to see a urologist. Uh, but in any case, we want to put this in, out there and put this on the agenda. Um, another thing related to this, which is always a good question to ask, is could any of my symptoms be a side effect of medications? Um, and so sometimes it's important to, to ask questions like this, that, um, you know, and I'm speaking as a doctor, that there have been a number of times where I get caught in looking at things in a certain way, and if a patient asks me a question, it can shake, shake my thinking loose in a bit. And I might say, well, actually, you're right. Um, you know, maybe your fatigue is re a result of your medications. Let's take a more careful look at your medication list. Um, so that's always an important question to, to have in the back of your mind and to ask about as you're going through these things. Uh, the second pillar is about emotional and spiritual support. Um, and here the skill is to go outside of that biomedical model. So really thinking about person-centered care. And some of the tools is that there's a lot of sources of counseling and even peer support. Um, chaplains, I would say, are very misunderstood. And I think a lot of people think that chaplains are strictly religious and are going to go in there and, and read you uh, the last rites or, or, or um, you know, try to share a Bible verse with you. And they can do that. Um, but, but chaplains do a lot more than that. And, and I've worked with chaplains in a number of different places. And chaplains are great about addressing those difficult emotions. So feeling sad, feeling hopeless, feeling meaningless. Um, finding resilience, finding sources of strength, uh, finding peace. Um, those are all things that, that chaplains can work with you on, whether you're a patient or a family member. Um, related to that is sometimes people find a lot of solace in getting connected with or getting reconnected with their spiritual community. Um, and I've seen that happen a number of times in our clinic as we talk about things that people are like, oh yeah, you know, I actually should, I've been thinking about going back to church and this would be a good time to do that. Or I've think, been thinking about getting back to the um, synagogue. Um, so, so we want to think about those things. Uh, psychologists uh, and mental health counselors um, are, are great. And I, I would put a caveat there is that you want to find the right match for yourself. And so if, if you saw a counselor and it didn't work, that doesn't mean counseling doesn't work. It just means that that counselor didn't work for you. Um, and so you may want to try again. You might try, um, you know, up to, you know, three or four or five or 10 times uh, before you find that right person. But when you find that right person, um, it can be really invaluable. Um, social workers can can help. Uh, support groups can be a, a source of help for people. And again, it's finding the, the right group for yourself, finding one that's a match, and friends and family, uh, coworkers. Um, and, and so, you know, the way I talk about this is, you know, coming out of the closet with Parkinson's and putting it on the table. Um, and that does take courage, but I I can tell you uh, from working with other people that 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 courage is is usually worth it. Uh, that when you put it out on the table, that you find uh, again that you're surrounded with more love and support than you imagined. Um, uh, preparing for the future is something that uh, a lot of people with Parkinson's have, have told us that is it, it just doesn't get brought up uh, by my doctor. Um, and so you can bring it up. 
Um, and, and in the world of cancer, there's been a lot of research on what are called question prompt lists, and we can use those same tools in the world of neurology. So this is just a few examples of questions that you could bring uh, with you to your visit. If these are things that would be important for you to develop a roadmap and to help you understand what's going to happen in the future. What is the best case, worst case, or most likely scenario for how my Parkinson's may progress? Um, and I word that that way purposefully because doctors are more comfortable uh, talking about the range of what can happen. A lot of times when you ask a doctor, um, what, what's my future look like? Their answer is everybody's different. Um, and that's accurate, but that's not really helpful. Um, and so if, if you're not putting them on the spot, you're not telling them, I expect you to have a crystal ball, uh, you're, you're just asking them for a roadmap. Uh, most doctors will be able to, to take you through that scenario and let you know what are the best case, worst case, and most likely case. Um, what should I be looking out for? So what are the symptoms that might indicate that my Parkinson's is progressing? Or what are the symptoms that might indicate that I should start thinking about DBS or that I should start thinking about um, stopping working and, and disability? Um, how can I and my family be better prepared for the future? Um, and some of these questions may be questions that your neurologist might direct you to a social worker or to somebody else on the team to help you with, depending on what you're, you're looking for. Um, and lastly, um, is, is asking to complete paperwork to put your future wishes in writing. And this can be a healthcare proxy, so who you would want to be your voice um, if you're ever not able to speak for yourself, a living will or advanced directive. So putting in writing uh, what you would want uh, if and when your Parkinson's progresses or if another health uh, thing comes up, such as uh, cancer, for example. Uh, what would you want and what would you not want? Um, uh, for some people, they would never want to uh, be on a breathing machine or would never want to have a feeding tube long term. And so those are things that are appropriate to talk about with your healthcare team and also appropriate to talk about with your family. Um, and again, all of these things are going to be addressed in more depth in, in future sessions. Um, family support. Um, so the, the skill here is for um, carers and caregivers and care partners uh, to not be so selfless uh, that, that we have to uh, uh, take care of our carers as well. And so having a checklist, and these are some of the things that I think are really important to think about. Um, Self-care, we, we don't want you to burn out. Um, and it's really important for you to be engaged and for you to be the best uh, care partner possible that you're also caring for yourself. Uh, part of that could include getting additional emotional, social, and spiritual support. So when I ask care partners what's the toughest aspect of things for them, um, a lot of times it's, it's seeing what's happening to their loved one and feeling hopeless and helpless. And so we absolutely want to offer that same support to family members. Uh, being prepared for the future and, and for a family member that might look very different than what it looks like for the patient. Um, having skills. So how, how do I help my loved one up if they fall? Um, how do I help them manage their medications? And, and for some people who have more advanced illness, getting extra help at home, uh, potentially to help with things like dressing, uh, respite, being able to, to manage things and having some time for yourself uh, when somebody requires a higher degree of care. Um, and the last pillar is um, getting specialists in palliative care. And I'm gonna talk about that in a second, but I just wanna reemphasize here is that at any time during your illness, you have the right to request referrals for other specialists or second opinions. And so if you feel like your bladder issues or your pain or your depression is not getting the care that it needs, um, it's perfectly acceptable for you to ask your, your neurologist, your primary care doctor uh, for an extra layer of support. Um, and, and supportive and palliative care is, is a piece of that. Um, so specialist palliative care, and this may be a neuropalliative care clinic, they might call themselves supportive care clinic, they might call themselves the next step clinic, uh, but the things that, that specialist palliative care can do includes help with challenging symptoms like pain and fatigue, uh, providing support around difficult but normal emotions uh, like grief, worry, frustration, and guilt, um, helping to explore spiritual or religious issues uh, that come up with having a serious illness, and that could be extreme hopelessness, loss of meaning, um, inability to find joy in things that used to uh, give you joy, uh, providing extra support for family members and caregivers. And, and when I use the word family, I use that very broadly. And so that could be friends, could be neighbors, it really could be anybody uh, that you consider to be part of, of your people, your family. Um, helping to talk about the big picture, including a roadmap for the future. And so there may be situations where uh, you, you might want to talk about that in more depth than your neurologist has time or expertise to do. Uh, to help coordinate care across multiple providers. And, and so it, it could be frustrating if you have a primary care provider and a cardiologist and a urologist and a gastroenterologist and a psychiatrist, 
Um, and everybody seems to, you know, be taking care of a different part of your body, but nobody's looking at the big picture. Um, palliative care can help uh, bring those things together. Um, and then lastly, to help you in terms of clarifying your goals and values or helping your family come to a uh, consensus about what are the goals and values that, that are important to drive care. Um, members of the typical team, um, and this can vary from location to location, but there may be a palliative medicine doctor, there might be a neural palliative care specialist, um, somebody in palliative medicine oftentimes has an internal medicine background and specializes in palliative care, whereas myself, I consider myself a neural palliative care specialist. I'm a neurologist, and I've learned extra things about palliative care. Um, other members of the team could include social workers, nurse, chaplain, counselors, psychologists, home health services, and home uh, palliative care, um, and, and all working together really to provide the best support possible for you and for your family. Um, so when to consider um, a referral for palliative care. So, so first I want to just make clear that this could be at any point in your Parkinson's journey. And I have seen people near the time of diagnosis, and I've certainly seen people uh, near the time of death. Um, and so really any, any time uh, uh, from beginning to end uh, may be an appropriate time for palliative care, depending on, on what's going on and what you're dealing with. If there are symptoms that have been difficult to control, um, uh, pain is one example where I see a lot of people with Parkinson's who are having a tough time controlling their pain and, and finding options for that. Uh, but it could be for, for fatigue, uh, for constipation, for other issues. Uh, people who are struggling with difficult emotions, so not just depression or anxiety, but uh, maybe uh, grief or, or guilt or frustration. Uh, people who are struggling to find uh, quality of life, who are really feel like they're surviving and want to get back in some semblance of, of living, that they want to find a little bit more pleasure, uh, a little bit more hope in their life. Uh, care partners or families who need more support. Uh, people who want more guidance to help plan for the future, to get a roadmap, uh, to understand the prognosis, understand even in, in broad terms, you know, what kind of timeline are we dealing with? Um, and if people are having a lot of problems coordinating care across providers or, or settings, uh, you know, maybe somebody's been in and out of the hospital a few times, been in and out of subacute nursing facilities, and really want to try to provide a more consistent uh, pattern of care. Um, when to consider hospice, so I bring this up again because it, it's an important topic, um, but hospice really comes up under a few situations. And again, when we're thinking about goals, uh, or the primary goal when we're considering hospice is going to be comfort, and it's going to be either staying at home or staying in an assisted living or nursing home if that's where you're living, but it's about avoiding the hospital. Um, and so if you were to develop pneumonia or another infection, and you would want to be treated where you are with oral antibiotics, you wouldn't want to go to the hospital, then hospice might be um, a good thing for you. It also could be a good thing if you would maybe not want those things treated, if you've reached a point where you really feel like um, more time is going to be more suffering. Uh, that, that could also be a time where, where you may think about hospice. Um, if you want to maximize your time at home and with family and friends, uh, hospice can help you to do that. Um, it provides um, an alternative to future emergency department visits and hospital stays. It provides an extra layer of medical support uh, for you in your home or wherever you're living. Um, and regarding uh, prognosis, that's something that we, you know, don't always have a good uh, sense of. Um, and so, you know, your provider can talk to you about it, whether you would qualify. And in the United States, you have to have a estimated prognosis of six months or less. But as I said, you know, it could end up being much longer than that, that we have a tough time predicting the future in Parkinson's disease. Um, so it's really more about, do you meet these criteria uh, for being at risk for dying? And if so, uh, let's get you the extra support. Um, the last thing that I do want to say here is that you have the power to change care. And so uh, the Parkinson's Foundation uh, really encourage you to continue to stay connected with them, to support them. Uh, they've been doing an amazing job of trying to bring palliative care and making palliative care a new standard of care. And, and so I, I couldn't think of a better group to partner with in this important work. Um, I'm the president of the International Neural Palliative Care Society, and we welcome uh, patient and family members. This is another avenue for people who really want to get involved in this. And then part of the reason we're doing this series is grassroots advocacy. Uh, the more that you as patients and families ask for this care, the more that you get this care, the more that we're going to change care, we're going to change standards. Um, and so as you ask for this care, your providers get the message, their bosses get the message that we need to provide a social worker in, in, um, in the neurology clinic, uh, their bosses uh, maybe, you know, start to change policy, starts to change conversation. And so we really feel like patients and families are not only the target of all of this, but, but patients and families are going to end up being the driver of change in this model of care. And so we really want to make sure that your voice is heard. 
Um, so to sum up, take-home points, uh, palliative and supportive care is a person and family-centered approach to improving quality of life for any serious illness, and Parkinson's is a serious illness. Uh, that palliative care addresses many important dimensions of care that are often overlooked, um, almost everything outside of this medical model. Um, you can use palliative care concepts to improve the care that you receive. You have that power to prepare for the future and to live well today. And specialist palliative care or hospice can provide an extra layer of support if you have an advanced illness, a challenging situation, or if you're getting near uh, the end of life. So I will uh, stop there and turn things over to Kelly to share her perspectives on this as a patient. Thank you, Dr. Kluger. And I want to share a little bit about Kelly before she uh, shares her story with us. Kelly was diagnosed with um, young onset Parkinson's in 2002 at age 29, and she's worked with the Parkinson's Foundation on our women in PD regional and national teams, the Parkinson's Foundation Research Advocates, and is a current member of the Parkinson's Advisory Council. Uh, Kelly has been working with the Parkinson's Foundation to help underserved Parkinson's community in Chicago, and Kelly Kelly's very passionate about raising awareness and advocacy in Parkinson's. So Kelly, um, will you share uh, some of the time that you spent in your experience with your father with palliative care? Yes, thank you so much. And thank you for, thank you for having me. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak about palliative care as it's near and dear to my heart. Um, I, as mentioned, I have had Parkinson's for 21 years. I was diagnosed at the age of 29. And I'm a volunteer and patient advisory volunteer and a patient advisory council for the Parkinson's Foundation. I'm honored to speak to you today about palliative care. I learned about palliative care about a year and a half ago when my father, who also had Parkinson's disease, became more advanced in his illness. No one had ever told my mother and I about palliative care and the benefits it could bring. My mom and I felt alone in his care as he transitioned to a care facility. For every issue that he dealt with, we struggled to find a solution. Sometimes it meant working with many doctors, and sometimes it meant having him live with symptoms that we couldn't solve. It left us feeling with despair and guilt and my dad frustrated and, and depressed. I strongly believed he would have fared much better in his quality of life with palliative care. After he passed, I wanted to get involved with palliative care initiative and help spread awareness. For me, I also learned the necessity of advanced care planning and that pal palliative care is a team-based bright light in the sometimes dark struggle to find care. I joined Dr. Kluger's advisory council to help voice my support and learn and learn how to help others realize that they're not alone in their care. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Kelly. Dr. Kluger, do you wanna ask Kelly any questions to hit any points home with her experience in palliative care? Uh, yeah, I, I guess I can ask uh, if, if you are, is, uh, has, are you incorporating palliative care into the care that you receive now? And, and, and if so, um, how are you doing that? I am not currently in, involved, incorporating into my care, um, but I have advised people to see in the Chicagoland area, um, the doctor at Rush, where I go for my care, to see the palliative care specialist there. In fact, I was just texting earlier today with a person who had some, um, who recently had a stroke that had Parkinson's that I advised them to go to palliative care for their needs because it's it's he's 49 years old and has a lot to deal with in the next few months, next few years and his family as well. So I advise them to see the palliative care specialist at Rush. So yes, I, I'm not myself looking at, uh, currently getting palliative care, but I know a number of people have sought it out since I've raised the awareness. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, Dr. Kluger, you mentioned in your presentation that palliative care is about living as well as possible for as long as possible. What would you like more people to know about palliative care and what are some of those key components of palliative care? How, how can people specifically living with Parkinson's disease benefit from palliative care? Yeah, I think um, one thing that, that's really important and that we're working a lot on is, is that, uh, so, so I think palliative care uh, suffers from two things and, and the word supportive care may, may help a little bit with this is that palliative care has been called the best kept secret in medicine. So a lot of people with Parkinson's simply don't know about palliative care. Uh, they, they don't know what it is. And for people who have heard of it, I think the most common thing that they've heard of is hospice and, and it's used at end of life and it's used for people with cancer. Mm -hmm. And so the, the tragedy that, that I've seen is that people with Parkinson's oftentimes don't get any palliative care or when they do get palliative care, actually kind of similar to Kelly and her family's story is that they get it late um, and that they wish that they had gotten it earlier. And, and I can't tell you how many times I've seen in my clinic 
um, of, of people who who I, I wish that I that I had started seeing them years earlier than I had, uh, because there that there is just a lot of opportunities. And getting back to your your question about living, that there was a lot of opportunities for living better. Uh, there were a lot of decisions that people probably would have made differently. That people may have had less regrets about what they're doing with their one precious life, with with this uh, so precious time, uh, that that could have been different. And and, and the other thing that I think is uh, really important is that. You know, even though people associate palliative care with, with end of life and with suffering, you know, I, I think the true goal of palliative care is to improve quality of life. And so no matter what people come to me with, uh, you know, pain's an example, but when I see somebody with pain, um, you know, I ask them, how is pain affecting their life? What is it taking them away from that they want to do? And, and that's what we work towards together. Um, and so the, the goal of palliative care, and I think Kelly and, and uh, Kirk and others on our um, advisory board have have asked us, you know, could we change the name of palliative care to uh, life enhancement care, or mm -hmm. or life improvement, or, or something else that that really just speaks to this this importance and and you know the sometimes magical power and it's it's awesome in clinic that we see people who come to our clinic feeling really hopeless and, and leave with a new sense of hope because we're we're talking about things that really uh, speak to the core of what's most important to them in terms of the difference between living and surviving. Great, thank you for answering my questions from our audience. Uh, Kelly, uh, what advice would you give to our participants about considering palliative care? When when would when would you start palliative care? Well, I think what I've learned through Dr. Kluger's team is that I would start it at the moment of diagnosis. I mean, I think he he has impressed on me so much that the the value of palliative care is great from from the very beginning. Um, but I think the hardest thing for me, and, and I will say growing up with Parkinson's because I've had it for so long and was so young, was forming my care team. And I did it myself and had to manage lots of different doctors and lots of different facets of care. And I think the palliative care option is really fascinating in that it provides a team approach and it really has someone to help you manage your own care. And I think that would be the biggest advice that I have is find somebody like a palliative care specialist that's available to you that can help you manage the, all the different aspects because it does affect the whole body and to manage the different aspects of, of Parkinson's care. Dr. Kluger, when would someone start palliative care? Yeah, I, I want, wanted to speak to that and, and kind of add to what, what Kelly was saying. Um, one thing, and, and, and it's, it's a tricky concept, but I think it's a really important one is to understand that, that palliative care is not just a specialty, uh, palliative care is also an approach. Mm. So I, I would say that the palliative care approach needs to start at the time of diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the things that we're doing and working really uh, closely with, uh, with our Kelly and our advisory board and the centers of excellence and all the wonderful neurologists and physical therapists and nurses at our centers of excellence is how can we integrate that palliative care approach into all of the care that's provided. Um, and so our, our work and our vision, and part of why I, I really emphasize the role of patients and families in driving this care is that, you know, from the time of diagnosis, you can make your care more palliative. Um, so when you're seeing your neurologist, you can bring up grief, you can bring up pain, you can bring up, uh, I want to talk about the future. Um, so I think there's kind of two questions there. So there's one question is when should this approach start? And this approach has started diagnosis, and this should inform everything that you do, and it should inform everything that we do. Um, and the, the other question is when might a specialist palliative care clinic or, or a palliative care specialist come in? And, and I think that's going to be different for different people. But I would say if, if you're reaching a point uh, where you don't feel like you're getting the support that you need, that you're not getting enough guidance, where there are symptoms that kind of go beyond the skill set of the, the providers that you're seeing, that that's an absolutely a fair time uh, to ask for a referral or ask for an extra layer of support. How can someone find a palliative care specialist? That, and that's a uh, can be tricky depending on on where you live. So we are working with centers of excellence, and I would say uh, a, a good number of centers of excellence, but not all, are are starting to have either integrated palliative care. Uh, so Kelly talks about the program at Rush, and, and Dr. Fleischer and, and uh, Kramer and other people. Um, are, are working on that. I'm doing that at the University of Rochester. So sometimes it's integrated into neurology. Uh, sometimes there's a palliative care clinic that's outside of neurology. So at, at the University of California, San Francisco, there's a great palliative care program that sees Parkinson's patients. And that's true at a number of other centers. Um, and, there, and there are some parts of the country where, where it's really difficult. And, and, and I think people run across this even with finding a movement disorder neurologist is that 
you know, depending on where you live, if you're in a rural area, if you're in even sometimes in urban areas, it's hard to find somebody who's a Parkinson specialist or a palliative care specialist. Um, and in those cases, sometimes it may be worth going to a center that has those services. Um, and, and maybe you see them by telemedicine after that first visit, or maybe you see them once a year. Um, or, you know, that, that you kind of use these checklists, you use the Parkinson's Foundation helpline, you, you use other resources uh, to try to build your own team. Um, and, and so, you know, both approaches uh, can work. I, I think there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. Um, I, I wish I could say that uh, everybody, you know, would have access to this care right now, but we're, we're just not there yet. And what are some questions individuals might ask their healthcare practitioner about palliative care when, when you know, this is kind of, this could be a new concept in considering adding this type of care to their health network. What are some questions that they might ask their primary care physician, their neurologist, movement disorder specialist about palliative care to uh, begin the conversation? Yeah, I can offer some comments and, and yeah, definitely be interested to hear from, from Kelly from her, her perspectives. Um, it, it, I, I think, you know, as, as I kind of alluded to in, in my slides, is that you, you do have the power to set the agenda for your visits. Um, and so if the toughest thing for you or the most important thing for you is, is care support or family support or, or grief or pain or, or whatever those uh, topics happen to be, um, that could be a time where you might uh, get a referral to a palliative care specialist. Um, it, it could be a time where you get a referral to a pain specialist or a counselor or somebody else. So it doesn't have to be a palliative care specialist. Um, and, and there's going to be education both ways. And this is honestly part of the reason why we're doing this series um, is that there are providers out there who may not know a lot about palliative care. And so when you bring up this topic and you can say, you know, I saw this webinar and, and I'm really interested in what palliative care can offer, I will say as a caveat that your provider may have misconceptions about palliative care and may say, well, I don't think you're ready for that yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just want to make sure that you're forewarned and forearmed that you could say, well, actually, I am ready for it because I, my understanding is, is that you can be delivered at any point and I really want some extra help around uh, my grief or my pain or whatever that happens to be. Um, so again, I think there's a, a ways to go. And I don't know, Kelly, if you have other advice from your lived experience on, on how, to, how to get this care from people you've talked to who have tried to get such care. Yeah, I think it's a matter of bringing it up to your practitioner. But I also think, you know, as you mentioned in your earlier slides, that there are checklists, um, you know, that can be provided. I think the patient doesn't know what they don't know. And so being provided with a checklist and being being asked to, um, you know, asking your doctor about these items in particular, help you get to the knowledge of, as a patient, what should I do next? How do I find out the right care provider? And, and how do I use, like you said, the palliative care mentality to further your care? Yeah. Great, thank you both so much for sharing your experiences. Um, playing devil's advocate here. Well, Judith wrote to us and, and saying, you know, they are enrolled in palliative care at a center of excellence and they're currently um, feeling disconnected uh, from their care providers. And they personally don't feel that they've benefited from palliative care. Um, what advice could you give someone who feels this disconnect from their providers? Um, I, I guess as I understand the question, and, and, and this is, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, I'm sure it's happened with people who've seen me as well as that, you know, sometimes it, it isn't, uh, you know, may not be the best match. Um, and, and I did mention, you know, that I think this is true for mental health counselors that sometimes you need to find the right match um, you know, sometimes there, there have been times where I, I wish people had given me a, a second chance. Um, and so, you know, you, you could bring up, and, and I, I would certainly welcome such feedback, um, you know, that if, if you were to tell me, you know, I, I came here and I really wanted to, to talk about a roadmap and you seem really focused on my pain, like I, I'd be happy to, to pivot and redirect. Um, also, you know, I would say most palliative care providers, and, and this may not always be true, um, I think understand that communication and relationships really at the, at the heart of, of the work that they do. And so if you were to, to bring that up and, and to let them know that, you know, look, I, I really wanted to see you and I, I keep ending up seeing a fellow or a medical student and, and this is really not working for me. Is there anything that, that we can do to, to try to increase our connection or care? Um, I, I think most providers would be open to that. I, you know, I can't speak to everybody. And, and, it, and it does get to the, to the question about getting a second opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's certainly something that I, I think most providers, but not all, you know, wouldn't be offended by. You know, if, if, if it's not a good match, it's not a good match. And, and let's try to get you connected to somebody who could help. 
Dr. Kluger, if I may, um, is, there, is there a risk that if you see a palliative care specialist that may not be within the practice of your movement disorder specialist or your neurologist, that they would be a little um, hesitant to continue your care, that maybe the palliative care specialist would take over your care? Uh, yeah, depending on where people are, there, there certainly could be that fear. Um, and, and that can be a fear also with hospice. Um, and so I, th I think it's important, and, and this is a question I ask people, but it's something that, that again, patients and families can let people know is that, you know, you, you can make it very explicit that I, I value you and I treasure you as a movement disorder doctor. I really like this care and I'd also like an extra layer of support and you can let your, your palliative care team know um, that, you know, Dr. Oaken or, or, or you know, wh whoever your, your doctor happens to be, Dr. Jones, uh, you know, is a, an important part of my team and, and please keep them in the loop and, and I want to continue to, to see them. Great question, Kelly. Thank you for offering that. Um, what resources would you recommend to someone who wants to learn more about this topic? We are at our time, so I'd like to end on, on some, some really tangible resources that we could offer our audience today. I might uh, push back, Krista, if, if you know, I, I know the Parkinson's Foundation is working on and hopefully we'll have soon a, a palliative care page. Yes. Uh, and, and, and that's going to have links to all of these videos and other resources. So that 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 should be out uh, in the near future. It's, so if you're watching this as a recording and not live, uh, that's going to be um, available. Uh, the Parkinson's Foundation helpline um, is definitely a resource. Uh, the Parkinson's Foundation um, Davis Finney Foundation, Michael J. Fox Foundation are all increasingly trying to incorporate uh, palliative care resources into the work that they do. The International Neural Palliative Care Society um, is working on, on creating more resources. So I, I think there's a lot of um, active interest. And I, and I would say, you know, literally over, over the next few months, there's going to be a lot more out there than there is today. Uh, Kelly, any final thoughts um, in introducing palliative care to our community today? No, I just think it's it's been a great learning experience for me. Um, I was not aware of palliative care, and I have since over the last year and a half really learned the benefits of it, and am a huge supporter. And I, and I think it's worth you know re people really looking into this and understanding that it's a benefit, and it's not it is not hospice, it is not end of life care, it is truly making your quality of life better. Well, thank you both so much for your time today and for sharing with our community of people with Parkinson's living with and affected by and working with people with Parkinson's disease today. I want to especially thank um, our expert speaker, Dr. Benzie Kluger. You have been essential to the development of our initiative in the palliative care series. So thank you for your time and your knowledge. Uh, you make it possible for us to bring these important education programs to our community. And Kelly, thank you for joining us live so that you are able to share your perspective as a person living with Parkinson's and um, caring for your father with Parkinson's and how palliative care supported um, your journey. And many thanks to all of you who joined us today. A follow-up email will be sent with a survey. Please tell us what you thought about today's program. You'll also receive a link to today's presentation with additional resources. Please join us for upcoming PD Health at Home programs each week for you and your loved one with Parkinson's, including Mindfulness Monday, Wellness Wednesday, and Fitness Friday. Join us to discuss the latest in Parkinson's research and DBS as an option for managing symptoms. In addition, we will look at important factors to help you live your best life, including sleep and mental health. This symposium will be held on January 27th in person at San Antonio, Texas, and streaming live for those that would like to join virtually. To learn more about this event, please visit parkinson.org slash tristate. If you had a question today that was not answered, please reach out to our helpline by calling 1-800-4-PD-INFO or emailing us at helpline at parkinson.org. You can use that same contact info to order our free resources, educational book series, and our hospital kit. I thank you all for joining us today as we kick off our palliative care series and look forward to seeing you again soon. Be well.